So again, hello everyone. Welcome to the Petroleum Refinery Remediation Case Study Webinar. Hi, my name is Drew. I'll be your presenter for the presentation today. And I'd always like to start out the webinars with a little background about myself. I have a BS in land use and GIS from the Metropolitan State University of Denver. And I'm currently the Digger and Voxler product manager uh, for about the past 10 years here at Golden Software. Uh, where I also work as the training coordinator, um, which I've been doing for about the past year and a half. So I'm here today to detail a petroleum refinery remediation case study, where we're going to discuss the various aspects of the site characterization of an LNAPL release at a refinery. And then we're also going to discuss modeling the LNAPL release using a combination of both Surfer and Voxler. At the end of the presentation today, I'm going to open it up for a few minutes to answer any questions. So you can send your questions to the webinar host via the questions function at any time. There is a questions box on the webinar control panel, and it's right under the audio section. So uh, please take a look, and this is where you can type in your question, and then it'll, it'll be forwarded to the webinar host, uh, who will then forward it me to answer. So if your control panel is minimized, uh, you can click the view menu and uncheck auto hide the control panel to view the panel. So we're also recording today. Um, so when we're finished with the webinar, a video will be available on our website, our support website at support.goldensoftware.com. And we also have a guest presenter with us today from the environmental remediation industry. Um, so in a, in a few minutes, I'm gonna introduce you to Steve Boynton, uh, who is the owner and operator of Subsurface Environmental Solutions, or SES, and was the lead remediation specialist on the project we're gonna be discussing today. For those of you that might remember, Steve joined us about six or eight months ago as a guest presenter on another webinar, and we got some really good feedback uh, on the presentation, so we invited him back today. All right, so I'm going to first start off with uh, giving you a little background information about Steve. Um, Steve is a, a Massachusetts licensed site cleanup professional, or LSP, where he holds a BS in civil engineering from Tufts and also an MS in geotechnical engineering. Uh, from UT in Austin. Um, Steve has 35 years experience in the consulting uh, in consulting in the subsurface uh, engineering space uh, where he is the owner and operator of subsurface, subsurface environment, environmental solutions LLC or SES uh, which he founded in 2006. SES focuses on assessment, management, remediation, and the closure of LNAPL sites, and also focuses on 2 and 3D model, modeling and data visualization. Now, Steve's been with us for a long time. Uh, he's been a Surfer user since 1986 and has been using Voxler uh, since 2007. Okay, you can see on screen, um, I can see on screen, uh, what you can see on screen right now is Steve's contact information. Okay, and most notably is the subenviro.com, which is his website. Um, please feel free to contact him uh, using any of these avenues. And again, these, uh, uh, contact information will be found on his website. Steve uh, primarily works in our applications for his projects. Um, so on his website, you'll also see some uh, really good examples of some of the Surfer and Voxer projects that he's, that he's done. And again, that's subenviro.com. Okay, so specifically today, we're going to be walking everyone through portions uh, of the case study, um, starting with Steve giving us uh, a little background information on El Napo, uh, what a release is, and then he'll give us a brief site description, 
uh, including the history of the release, um, the recovery of the LNAPL, and also providing a brief site assessment. And then finally, I'll be uh, covering how the visual site model was uh, assembled, again, using both Surfer and Voxler. And through this process, uh, Steve's gonna be providing some additional commentary about various portions of the project and the supporting data. Now, before we get uh, into a discussion about the site characterization on how the visual site model was generated, I'd first like to touch on a, a comparison between the project we discussed during the last presentation that Steve and I teamed up on and the presentation that we're, we're discussing today. Um, so in, in April, last April, 2018, SES and Golden Software teamed up on a webinar uh, that was based on a project that SES did where the LNAPL was characterized using an ex situ UVF technique. And you can see that on screen here. I'm going to rotate that a little bit for you. Uh, this project included ISO surfaces and well renders. And then SES also incorporated some various uh, CAD and 3D DXF elements into the model. And you can see those. Uh, on screen there as well. And this was a relatively small LNAPL release um, with uh, not very many uh, wells, right? Not, not very many borings. Um, and today we're going to be focusing on an LNAPL release again. But however, uh, the project that we're going to discuss today is uh, using some different technologies. So, for example, we're going to be discussing a, a LIDAR-generated ground surface. We're also going to be modeling the soil stratigraphy using CPT data for the site. And in this uh, project, the LNAPL was characterized using an in-situ LIF technique, and we'll give you some more information on that. And probably the most notable difference here is that the project that we're discussing today is using much larger data, much much larger data sets, uh, where the data sets contain um, at least fifty thousand points uh, in each one. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, so he can give us some background information about the project, including the site description, the LNAPL, and where it was so sourced from, and etc. So, Steve, I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to you. Okay, thank you, Drew. Um, welcome, everybody. We're happy to have you join us today. So I'm going to give a very brief description of what LNAPL is. Um, I can see most of you are probably in the environmental business, but on the off chance that you don't work with this contaminant type, we'll just go through the properties of LNAPL. So LNAPL is a liquid contaminant. Uh, we mostly think of uh, fuel oils and gasolines um, at service stations, but uh, this is a refinery project, so the number of refined products was very high, plus we had crude oil being pumped into the site, so um, this is a commingled plume that we're dealing with. So LNAPL uh, stands for light non-aqueous phase liquid, meaning lighter than water, and the non-aqueous part means not readily soluble in water. Uh, you can see in the table on the right that we've got some common LNAPL types listed. These are just selected to give a range of um, properties and you can see the solubility ranges from um, almost completely insoluble for the crude oils up to uh, 164 milligrams per liter for gasoline and then uh, 10 times higher for benzene. The densities of LNAP will vary quite a bit. Most people take a number in the 0.8 range for um, gasolines and diesels that we see on a lot of sites, um, something from 0.8 to 0.9. But you can see for crude oils, the density can get close to one. Um, six oils would be another example of an LNAPL that um, has a density close to water. And um, so most LNAPL sites that we have, um, we typically, you know, they're, they're all around the world. Many, many contaminated sites, particularly gasoline stations and um, fuel oil releases, whether they're residential business or at terminals. Um, and also 
we have residual products like number six oil. If you go to my website, you can see a couple sites, or at least one site that was a six oil site. Um, and all the same technologies apply and the Surfer and Voxler, uh, great tools for visualizing those releases. Um, go to the next slide. So the site that we're working on today is uh, in the Midwestern part of the United States. It was a refinery from the 20s until the early 90s, at which point refining operations were terminated and the terminal, um, terminal demolition began. Um, SES came into this job as a specialty consultant. Uh, there was a local firm, large national firm, that was managing operations on the site. And... Um, SES was brought in to look at this large LIF data set that had been collected um, and the client wanted some help in understanding how to convert the LIF data to TPH data and just sort of how to manage LIF data in general. It was a, a new technology at the time and uh, SES has a significant background in the petroleum fluorescence area. Um, depth to groundwater at the site is about 10 to 20 feet, really more 10 to 15 feet at most locations, uh, discharging to a stream along the eastern boundary of the site, which you can see uh, in the upper air photo, it's probably most clear, the dark line going down the east side of the property was a creek that then became channelized and uh, elm apple breakouts had occurred in that creek. And that's, of course, what started the assessment and remediation operations. Um, we can go to the next slide. And we'll turn this back to you, Drew. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so now that uh, we've given you some background information on the site and the Elm Apple itself, I'm going to move on to discuss how the visual site model or the VSM that SCS created for this project was assembled. Okay. And you can see uh, the final product uh, on screen right now. Now, as far as the visual site model was created, uh, we're gonna start off with uh, putting this, piecing this together uh, piece by piece. I'm starting with the ground surface, uh, which is, uh, is gonna incorporate some LIDAR data, and then gonna be visualized in Voxler using the height field module. We're also gonna discuss adding some storage tanks and holding tanks. Um, of course, this is where the Elm Apple was uh, originally sourced from. And we're going to add groundwater surfaces uh, in both for both the high and low levels. Uh, and these were generated from surfer grids and then visualized in Voxler using height fields. We're going to add a groundwater flow direction map uh, that was based off a grid vector map from surfer. And then we're also going to add some CPT data. Uh, to visualize the soil behavior type uh, using a face render inside of Voxler. And then also the LIF or the fluorescence data that Steve just mentioned. Uh, we're gonna bring that in uh, into Voxler and visualize it using a series of ISO surfaces. And then finally, uh, so the rem remediation efforts uh, were uh, started with some in, uh, interceptor trenches and we're gonna add 3D DXFs to visualize those uh, in the visual site model as well. Now I'm gonna be discussing how this all works on the software side of things uh, for each aspect of the, the VSM or the visual site model. And then Steve's gonna um, pepper in some technical commentary about each aspect as it pertains to the site. Okay, so we're gonna first start off with discussing the ground surface. Okay, and this, uh, the ground surface was uh, created in Surfer. SES's original project uh, did not uh, include a ground surface that was generated from LIDAR data uh, because this data at the time was not available. But however, when Steve and I were working on the case study for this presentation, uh, we decided to add a surface that was uh, created from a free LIDAR data set um, where we extracted the canals and then mosaiced the canals uh, back with the original ground surface that he used uh, in the visual site model. This is going to allow us to see the drainage canals around the site in 3D, uh, which again are going to be a critical part of the model, and then also use uh, 
a less detailed or simplified uh, ground surface for the area around the site. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this ground surface was generated in Surfer. I'm going to open Surfer up here for you. Okay, and, and what you can see on screen now, uh, I have a 3D surface map uh, for the area for this project. And again, this surface itself was generated from LIDAR or LAS data that uh, was downloaded from the USGS's 3DEP program. The uh, LAS was gridded here in Surfer, and you can really see some good detail on the surface, and, and this is a probably uh, much more detail than was needed in the project. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit so we can see this detail. All right, and you can see um, most notably uh, there's the stream and canal network, and along this eastern side of the site, uh, this is the uh, canal that we're uh, most interested in, and we're going to add to the model. One thing I wanted to note uh, is that uh, once we add some vertical exaggeration, I can just bump this up a little bit, um, probably a little too much there. But these features, there's so much detail um, that they really get blown up. Uh, and so this is why we decided uh, to use a less detailed uh, surface uh, for the visual site model. Okay, and so uh, what I'd like to go through now is uh, the series of uh, events that uh, took place to create the uh, ground surface that we're going to use in the Voxler model. And so right up here in the upper left, you can see a contour map that I uh, created from the LiDAR data uh, after it was gridded. And you can probably see this, and I'm, I'm mousing over it right now. There is this uh, channel and stream network right here on the uh, eastern uh, boundary of the site. I digitized that uh, using Surfer's Polygon tool um, to create a blanking file, right? And I use this vector file to assign node data to the grid file um, and to extract the uh, channel right here. And you can see the channel, um, the LiDAR data was added with this surface here. Uh, and you can see that in, in means of a contour map. This is the uh, more simplified ground surface. And I added these two together, or mosaic them together inside a surfer um, to create our uh, less detailed surface, uh, but still retaining that uh, 3D canal. And right here at the bottom uh, on screen, you can see the same thing in 3D. We've extracted the uh, channel uh, and then mosaic it with the less detailed ground surface uh, to get our final ground surface. This final ground surface. Uh, was then imported into Voxler. So I'm going to go ahead and, and flip back over to here to Voxler. And you can see uh, that I've already imported this ground surface. Right? And you can see there's not as much detail uh, on the top here, but we do have uh, a nice uh, representation of the channel. Okay, so SES assembled uh, the VSM or the visual site model uh, for this project in Voxler, where all these elements that were, were created in Surfer were then imported into Voxler and then built upon. Okay, so we can make this surface look a little bit more lifelike by importing an image, uh, an aerial image from the area that was downloaded from another free online resource and then uh, draped over the surface. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that element into the uh, visual site model now, just simply by importing, selecting my image overlay. And I can uh, simply drape this over the 3D surface by taking the connector and dragging it to the height field and choosing to uh, use this as the uh, image overlay. Uh, 
Let me rotate the surface down just a little bit. And you can see the aerial image doesn't fit the extents and it doesn't look like the canals are lining up. Uh, this means that we need to probably change the fit for the image, for the overlay. So I'm gonna go ahead and do so uh, by easily by selecting the height field and moving down to the property manager. And on the image overlay tab, we have this uh, fit parameter. As you can see, it's set to stretch over surface. If we change this to clip to surface, uh, we can uh, texture map the georeference coordinates uh, inside of the aerial image to that of the uh, grid file or the, the height field. Okay, so now you can see we have a better fit of our image uh, and that canal is clearly uh, draped uh, over the canal and the image is clearly draped over the 3D surface. Okay, and we really uh, have a nice surface to build the visual site model on. Okay, so the next step uh, that SES did in assembling the visual site model was to add um, a, a few of the holding and storage tanks that were on the site before demolition uh, and were the source of the Eln Apple. Okay, we used the well renderer modules to model these tanks, uh, and this is really not the true or intended purpose of this module, but it does really work well in this situation. Okay, let me go back to Voxler. And up in the Network Manager, uh, that you can uh, see that I have uh, already imported three different data sets uh, that are going to be used for the tanks. And I did this in advance to save a little bit of time. So we can go ahead and uh, click the visibility of the tanks on. Okay, you can see that uh, I have three different size tanks here and three different data sets. And again, these are uh, being visualized using the well render module. Right, and these centroids from these tanks uh, were digitized inside a surfer uh, where I used um, the historical image or the black and white image that Steve showed you uh, a few slides ago. Right, and that was then incorporated uh, into our data and then again visualized using the well renderer. So as you can see, we are, we're um, getting a real nice looking model here. Um, and let's go forward with uh, assembling the VSM. Okay, groundwater elevation. So the groundwater elevation surfaces um, are also a very important aspect of the project. Where SES used a surfer uh, to create the two groundwater surfaces, which were both based on uh, over 200 monitoring, monitoring wells uh, across the site. So the two surfaces that were created uh, that we're gonna use in the visual site model were based on the high and low groundwater marks taken over a multi-year range of observations. So these surfaces uh, were used in the model to show where the Eln Apple interacts with the underlying water table. And so once this uh, point data was gridded in Surfer, uh, it was then imported, and the grid files were then imported into Voxler as curvilinear lattices, and again visualized using height fields. And additionally, uh, Surfer was used to create a vector map uh, using the high groundwater table grid file, which was, uh, this vector map was used to indicate the flow direction within the water table across the site. And it's gonna give you a good indication on, the hel on how the Eln Apple will move once it hits the sand layer and interacts with the groundwater. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to Voxler and um, 
to save time here, I'm not going to show you how to grid the data or or create the vector map in Surfer, as uh, you know these are both uh, pretty straightforward tasks uh, inside a uh, inside a Surfer. But I will add these to the Visual Site model at this point. So just by importing them, I'm going to start with the low water table grid file that was created in Surfer. And again, we use the import as curvilinear lattice option. And then uh, a height field was used to visualize the water table. And change the color map real quick. And again, I'm going to repeat these steps uh, for uh, the high water table. Of course, this is another grid file that was created in Surfer. And I'm going to use this import as curvilinear lattice option. And this is going to allow these surfaces to locate using the correct Z level. Okay. Let's add a height field. And change the color mapping again. And let me rotate the model here, the visual site model, to the side a little bit. And these are very close together. Very hard to see any differentiation between the two. So I'm going to go ahead and add some uh, vertical exaggeration here. And bring the model back into fo focus. Right, and at this point, you should be able to see uh, now there's both uh, groundwater surfaces of the high and low levels have been added to the model. And additionally, uh, I mentioned a vector map that was uh, exported from Surfer. Uh, this was done in DXF format. And again, this is going to be used to show the flow direction inside the water table. Uh, and I'm going to use this inside the visual site model as a vector overlay for the high groundwater surface. So let's go ahead and uh, add this in. Gonna, gonna uh, select my flow direction or vector map, and this is uh, in DXF format. All right. And you can see, and this is uh, how all vector files get added to the map. Um, they use a Z level of zero, uh, and we can overlay these uh, vector files on an elevation source, such as the, the high water grid table, which I'm going to do right now, simply by dragging the connector over to the height field and choosing to use this as a vector overlay. Once I do so, you can see that these vector arrows have now been overlaid uh, on the high groundwater surface. We can add some opacity to that surface so we can see them uh, through the top level. Of course, I'm changing the, the transparency type here. And you can see the direction of flow through the project. And it might actually be easier if I turn this uh, ground surface off. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle that off. Okay, so next in constructing the visual site model uh, for this project would be modeling the CPT data. So uh, once again, I'm gonna turn it uh, back over to Steve so he can give you some background information about the CPT data and why it was used uh, in this project. So Steve? Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. So um, I'm going to give you a little detail on what cone penetrometer testing or CPT data, uh, CPT testing is all about. Um, on this slide, there's a schematic of a uh, CPT device. Um, 
And in the tip of the device, there is a load cell. So that measures the point resistance as the cone is uh, pushed at a constant rate into the soil. Um, tip resistance is typically low in clays and high in sands and gravels. Um, along the side of the um, cone are strain gauges and they measure friction along the side of the cone. Um, generally in a clay, you'll have relatively higher friction than you will point resistance versus sand where you'll have a lot of um, tip resistance and not as much friction. Um, so we call the tip resistance Q sub T and side friction F sub R, and you'll see that in a slide in a minute. The cone can also measure pore pressure. Um, we're not intending today to get deeply into um, how you interpret CPT results, uh, but we will scratch the surface a little bit in a minute. Uh, as the cone is pushed into the ground, data is recorded about every three quarters of an inch or every couple centimeters. Uh, so at this site, most of the borings were around 25 feet deep, so you're getting, um, let's say, around 400 points per boring, and we've got close to 200 borings. So you can see you get uh, something like 80,000 data points um, that you have to manage when you're done. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about how we cut. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So this is a, a typical log of a CPT uh, plot. You can see on the um, along the top, you'll see friction, tip resistance and pore pressure. Those are the three parameters I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, so I'll direct your attention to the middle graph, which is the tip resistance versus depth. Um, and you can see that the tip resistance is uh, relatively low, picks up a little bit between five and 10, then drops off again down to about 15. And then at 15 feet, the tip resistance increases um, substantially. And that would be the zone where we have encountered sands dense sands and gravelly sands at the site. On this particular log, you also see the tip resistance um, decrease again from 20 to 25 feet, and that was a uh, specific portion of the site that happened to have a buried clay channel underneath the sand, and that was kind of anomalous for most of the site. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk here about uh, how the tip resistance and side friction are combined um, to calculate what we call the soil behavior type index. So on the left side, you'll see the layout of the borings on the site. Um, these are the grid borings, which were done on approximately a 200 foot spacing or 200 foot grid in the X and Y direction. So when we get all this um, uh, tip, fr tip resistance and friction data at these 80,000 points, we need to calculate a soil behavior type index. So I've presented a sort of simplified equation that shows um, this parameter I sub C or soil behavior type is calculated primarily from um, inputs of tip resistance and friction. Um, so once you run all these numbers through the, um, in a spreadsheet format through this equation, you get a calculated value of I sub C for every data log. Um, and these values of I sub C fall into ranges that are recognized as um, being representative of certain soil behaviors, engineering properties of soil. So um, you can see for the range, for example, for clay, the I sub C value ranging from 2.95 to 3.6. And that I sub C value drops as you um, get into the more coarse materials and then gravelly sand, dense sand, represented by values less than 1.31. For our purposes, those numbers don't mean so much, but the ability to apply color mapping in, in Voxler to the CPT data is what really counts. So we use this, so, this color map that's shown in the right column, uh, where dark brown represents clays and light brown, the silt mixtures, grading down into uh, towards the bottom, the yellow and fuchsia colors, um, or magenta, I guess that's called, um, so those two colors really represent the most permeable soils on the site, and those were um, saturated soils below the water table, and that's where the vast majority of elm apple is found at the site and where it migrates towards the stream on the east side of the property. Um, in the clays up above, the napple actually did have to get down through the clays and silts, and that generally was through vertical flow in the Vado zone, and then when it hit the saturated zone, it would... Uh, migrate laterally and commingle. Uh, there were many, many source areas on the site 
Um, today we're really just going to address the areas in the sands and gravels that um, the El Napo mixed and migrated in. So um, I think the next slide is back to you, Drew. Yes, it is. Thank, thank you, Steve. Okay, so um, I'm now going to uh, import the CPT data uh, into Boxlers as points. And again, this is a, a very dense data set, as Steve mentioned. So it's going to take just a few seconds to import here. Okay, so we're going to let uh, Boxler think. It's about 30 seconds for the import. And again, this CPT data is going to uh, allow us to model the soil, soil behavior type uh, across the site. All right, almost there. OK, so now that the data has been imported, uh, it's a critical step here to set the column assignments for the data correctly in the property manager. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down here and look. And again, first, I'm going to change my output type to points. Uh, I'm going to make sure my easting and northing columns are set correctly uh, for X and Y, and they are. And I'm also going to change uh, my Z coordinates. And then probably most notably here is the component. And we are going to use that um, soil behavior type index. Uh, again, this was calculated in the data prior to uh, importing it into Boxler. Okay, and that was uh, calculated using that equation that Steve was just discussing. Okay, so now that uh, we have everything set correctly, I'm going to go ahead and add a scatter plot here so we could visualize this data. And change some of the properties here uh, ever so slightly. And I know Steve just mentioned the color mapping. And so I'm going to load in a color map file for the soil behavior type uh, that matches that uh, graph that he just showed you. Okay. And I also think it'd probably be uh, beneficial here to uh, turn off the groundwater levels at this point. As I rotate this model around a little bit, um, it's you're able to start to see where the soil layers and the soil um, from the soil behavior type colors um, have, have been added here uh, to the visual site model. But we can uh, visualize this a little more clearly by adding a face renderer module uh, to, the, to the visual site model here. But before this can be done, uh, the data needs to be gridded. I'm going to go ahead and add a gridder here. So in the gridder, uh, SES chose to set uh, the anisotropy to anisotropic. And doing so is going to let him specify that the data points in one direction within this CPT data set have a higher weight than the points in another direction. Okay, so we're, we're changing the weight. Uh, if the points in one direction have more similarity than the points in another direction, it's in advantageous to give the points in that specific direction more weight when determining the value of each lattice node uh, during the gridding process. Okay. For example, Steve used 230 feet uh, in both the X and Y directions. Go ahead and add those in. And then also two feet in the Z direction. Uh, and this really makes sense as soil layers are typically uh, 
uh, have more similarity in the horizontal directions than they do in the vertical directions. SDS used 230 uh, feet uh, in the X and Y directions because of the well spacing, right? And they're uh, uh, spaced out a little less than this distance. Next, uh, let's change the resolution, make this a little more uh, higher resolution. And I believe on the, uh, uh, the original uh, model, SES used uh, a little higher, about twice this resolution. Uh, just for time's sake, we're going to go ahead and use 100 by 100 by 100 uh, to create the resulting lattice. And then finally, on the search tab in the gridder, uh, SES used similar settings to, that were used for the anisotropic weighting. Okay, So I'm going to change my search type here to anisotropic. And again, 230 feet uh, in the X and Y directions. And then uh, two feet uh, in the Z. Now using these settings here on the search, we're going to tell Voxler to only consider the data points uh, which we're defining in the search ellipse uh, by the X, Y, and Z lengths. The anisotropic weighting uh, will then be applied during the gridding process inside this search ellipse. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and grid this data uh, by simply clicking this begin gridding button. You can see that uh, Voxler is working on this at this point. We'll just give it a few seconds here to, to complete. All right, looks like it's almost done. And we see the little indicator light turn to green here on the gridder. That means it's ready to go. And, and so now that this data has been gridded using uh, the parameters we just specified, a face render module can be added uh, to show the soil behavior type. So I'm going to go ahead and add that in. And we, of course, can use the same uh, color mapping um, that we used for uh, the scatter plot. And this will, again, match that uh, soil behavior type that Steve was discussing earlier. And if I rotate this down just a little bit, you can see these rings. I'm going to trim these off here, but uh, these are good indications of the uh, that search radius. So I'm going to go ahead and change the geometry ever so slightly here. And we turn off the ground surface <coughs> and uh, the CPT, CPT uh, boring data. I'll give you a good look at the soil behavior type um, across across the project. And so at this point, you can clearly see the soil composition uh, within the VSM. And the Eln Apple uh, was going to be modeled, was modeled and delineated using LIF data. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Steve um, so he can give us some background information uh, about the, the LIF data. Okay, thank you, Drew. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about what LIF is first. Um, so LIF stands for laser induced fluorescence. Uh, the key word there is really the fluorescence, which is the uh, phenomena that petroleum compounds um, exhibit, which is when an incoming um, ultraviolet wavelength of light is introduced to the Elna apple, a different wavelength uh, light is emitted from the Elna apple, and that can be measured. Um, so LIF is an in situ technique that's uh, done by direct push of a probe. Um, on the picture on the right, this is not this site, but another one of my LIF sites where uh, we were using a geoprobe to perform the direct push operations. And you can see the geoprobe drill rig on the left, and on the right, you can see a rack holding um, drill rods with a cable 
that is threaded through the rods. That's a very expensive fiber optic cable with two strands of um, optical cable running down to the tip of the um, probe. On the lower left of the uh, three pictures uh, shows the tip of the probe with a window cut in the side of the window. The window has a sapphire, um, uh, is a sapphire window and just at the window level the fiber optic strand comes down and there is a mirror mounted at 45 degrees so the light comes down one strand of the fiber optic cable, reflects off the mirror into the soil as it's pushed into the ground, and the petroleum uh, aromatic compounds, the aliphatic compounds don't fluoresce, but the aromatics do, and they give off a different wavelength of light, and that can be recorded um, as that signal travels up the other strand of the fiber optics. Um, on the lower right of the three pictures is a, a little blue box over the window, and that can be used to calibrate so that every site um, is measured the same way. Uh, that box has a little calibrant fluid in it. Um, the, um, similar to the CPT, the data is recorded on approximately a two foot, uh, excuse me, a two centimeter interval as we go down. So again, you get uh, close to 400 data points and a 25 foot boring. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So on this particular site, we had um, a two, phase program. The first was a grid program where borings were put in on about a 200 foot center. There were 188 of these borings. Typically went to about 25 feet. Um, there was also what was called a biased boring program and those are coming up on screen now, the red dots. Um, those are done in an attempt to better characterize the source areas on the site. Um, those only went to 10 feet. Um, but there are an awful lot of boring. So um, again, the data was recorded on a two or three centimeter spacing um, in the deep um, borings. We had over 34,000 data points and in the shallow, because there were so many borings, we actually had approximately 60,000. So there had to be some massaging and we separated all these recordings into deep versus shallow. Uh, at the time, Microsoft Excel was limited to 65,000 rows, so we were bumping up against the data limits of a spreadsheet, but now you have, I think, a million rows that you can use in Excel. Uh, so that's what the, uh, the layout of the boring program looked like. If we can go to the next slide, we'll look at what an LIF log looks like. So on the right side of the screen, we have a typical LIF log uh, from the site, and we say across the top that this is a typical LIF log from the source area. Um, now on the, on the left-hand picture, uh, there is a white cross-section line that Drew can probably highlight. Um, the, um, so there's four borings shown, and the, the one on the upper left is the one that we're looking at here, boring G122. Um, so we picked this one, and we picked this cross-section line to show how LNAPL behaves as it migrates in a down gradient direction from the source area. But let's look at this first source area log. What you see from a depth of zero down to three or four feet, not much, and then you start to see a pickup in the fluorescence signal. So from about three feet down to um, around 13 feet, there's some um, clear indication of elm apple in the Vado sown soils. And then when you get down to around 13 feet, the signal picks up significantly, and that would be where you're penetrating into the saturated sand material and um, you may actually be getting NAPL that was released in that area or even upgradient of um, the, the particular boring location. Um, and you can see that the thickness from about 13 down to 25 feet, so a 12 foot thick zone is where the NAPL was present. A lot of people think L-NAPL floats on the groundwater table, but clearly doesn't. The water table in this particular site was probably around um, 13 feet or so, and the NAPL had penetrated uh, more than 10 feet below that. Um, so let's go to the next slide and we'll look at how l NAPL behavior changes as it migrates. Oh yes, on the bottom of the screen, we've highlighted the, um, the x-axis. For this first boring, the x-axis is different than for the other three because the uh, peak values were so much higher. Uh, we can go to that next slide again. Um, so we're showing these four borings from the source area to the discharge location at the stream going from left to right. So at G122, 
we have a source area boring that we just discussed and this, the x-axis goes out to 500 in this case. The other three, the x-axis, um, just went to 300. And you can see at the next boring, G157, that we no longer have the Vado zone uh, impacts from zero to say 13 feet. They have um, just, uh, that that napple migrated vertically downward in the source area and this particular boring is well away from the source area and only impacted by migrating napple in the sands. Um, so you see a couple things. The thickness of the impacted zone has decreased a little bit and the peak LAF values have also decreased. Um, then moving further down gradient to boring G177, you see a lot of the napple uh, impact zone thickness has decreased and you really just have one peak. Um, so migration is through probably just a thin high permeability zone or lens at that point. And we show the final boring, which is G186, which is actually on the opposite side of the stream. And an effort was made to show that there had been no migration beyond the stream boundary. Um, so that sort of summarizes how NAPL um, profiles change as you move down gradient from a source area. Um, I can go to the next slide. I think this is probably back to you, Drew. Yeah, yes, it is. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, so I'm going to go back to Voxler, and um, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at this uh, LAF data that Steve, Steve was just discussing. Um, so I'm going to turn off the face render here, and, and to save a little time on loading the data, I've already brought this in uh, into the project, and you can see it uh, here, right? And we have a nice rainbow color map that you can see uh, the different concentrations, but uh, probably easier to see uh, would be to look at this data in a gridded format. And so um, I've already gridded the data and SCS used some very similar uh, gridding parameters. And let's take a look at those really quick um, as they did with the, that we used for the CPT data. Okay, so very similar, similar length here uh, in our weighting. Uh, 240 feet in both the X and Y directions, uh, and then a Z length of a little bit less, um, and uh, about the same res resolution uh, lattice was being created, and then also very similar search parameters uh, were being used, again, 300 feet in both the X and Y lengths, and about uh, a half foot in the Z length. Now to delineate these, uh, these different uh, uh, concentrations of the Allen Apple, uh, SES used a series of ISO surface modules um, that were set at uh, target ISO values, okay? uh, which was the highest concentration level here at uh, 300. Okay? And you can see that's the highest concentration levels. And as I go, uh, to lower concentration levels. You can see them clicking these ISO surfaces on. It might be beneficial to take off these boring locations. And then also visualize this uh, using the ground surface. All right. I think for our next set of quick drawings. Okay, so the for the final portion of the visual site model uh, that needs to be added before it's complete uh, were the El Napple interceptor trenches. And you can see these on screen right here. These trenches were added uh, to the project on the site um, in recovery efforts uh, to recover remediation efforts to recover the Elm Apple um, from a few critical locations. Okay, and you can see that these locations are right here highlighted in red. So Steve used an empty base layer inside a surfer 
uh, that was overlaid on the aerial georeferenced aerial image, um, and then used the polygon tool to digitize the location of these trenches. Okay, and this was done to a, an empty base layer. This base layer was then uh, exported to uh, DXF format and then loaded into uh, TurboCAD. And so where Steve uh, took these extruded 2D polylines, or excuse me, took the 2D polylines and then extruded them uh, into 3D, right? And so we have some 3D polylines at this point in TurboCAD and then exported to 3D DXF um, to use as representation of the trenches. So these uh, trenches, the 3D DXF, was then, uh, that was created in TurboCAD, in the Surfer in TurboCAD, was then imported uh, into the visual site uh, model inside of Voxler. So I'm gonna go ahead and import these recovery trenches um, inside of Voxler so you can see uh, where the recovery efforts were being made uh, compared to the location of the Elm Apple. Okay, I'm just going to import these uh, real quickly. 3D DXF. And you can see uh, these different locations from the last slide um, are also in the visual site model. And I'm going to go ahead and turn uh, the site field off for just a sec. Ground surface. All right. And you can see there's a, a couple critical locations where uh, a few on the eastern uh, side of the project along the stream and canal, and then some uh, more interior to the project trenches were added. Okay, again, these were recovery trenches. All right, so that is the final portion of the model. I'm going to turn everything back on here so we can take a look. Uh, how everything lays together in the visual site model, including the CPT data. Let me rotate this around just a little bit. And so we can see where uh, the LIF and CPT data uh, overlap or, or uh, work together here. All right, I'm just gonna put a, a single slice from the face render and slide it back through the model. And then you can see the, uh, the soil behavior type uh, where the majority of the El Napa lived in this range uh, was in the sands, right? And this is what Steve indicated uh, earlier. And you can see a good example of this as uh, I move this slice back and forth, uh, just for the most part uh, in most areas within the, within the model. Uh, that clay layer is, uh, or the El Napo rather would be sitting right below that clay, those clay layers. <laughs> All right, so we now have the complete uh, visual site model that SES uh, used to submit to the client. Uh, and then uh, Steve's recommendations were based off uh, off this model. Now at this point, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and like I said at the beginning of the webinar, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up uh, for any questions from the audience and we'll we'll get any, any of the questions answered here that, that uh, have came up. Okay. Okay, it looks like I have time for just a, I know we're up against our uh, uh, eight o'clock my time here, uh, but I just have a few questions that I wanted to um, uh, to, to discuss. Um, and the first question was, um, how was uh, the vector map exported, the flow map exported from Surfer? Um, really good question. I'm gonna go ahead and flip back to Surfer here so we can see this. Uh, we used the high groundwater surface uh, to create the vector map, and it was easily made um, by clicking home, new map, and in the specialty category, we used a one grid vector map. Once that one grid vector map uh, was created, uh, again from that high uh, groundwater table grid file, 
uh, we simply exported it to 3D DXF, or excuse me, 2D DXF, uh, and then uh, imported it in the, into, um, into the project. <laughs> so great question there. Uh, and it looks like I have time for one more question. Uh, and the question is, um, can the face, can the face uh, render showing the CPD data be smooth? And that's a really good question. I'm gonna um, rotate this around just a little bit so we can see um, uh, exactly what you're asking here. Uh, and so on the face render, um, and we're talking about smoothing probably around these edges or these boundaries uh, of the different soil behavior types. Uh, this is um, really a function of the of the geometry settings we used in the gridder. You can see the resolution I set uh, to 100 by 100 by 100, and see these are actual voxels that you're seeing. Uh, if I increase these values, just as uh, SES and Steve did, Um, if you increase these uh, these parameters here, you're going to get a finer uh, resolution lattice, and you'll decrease this stair step effect just a little bit. And that looks like um, oh, it looks like I have uh, one other question. Uh, the last question I hear is I have here is from Randy. Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, any suggestions for non-regular spacing sample points? Um, that's a that's going to be a, a tough one to deal with um, <clears throat> when you're gridding the data. Um, Steve, did you want to comment about uh, gridding the data here inside of inside of Voxler? Well, I would say that this site is probably pretty easy because you do have regular spacing of the borings. Um, and that's um, sort of atypical. I think most sites have irregularly spaced data. Uh, the key really to success is having a sufficient amount of data, both vertically and laterally. Um, you know, if you have borings that are widely spaced apart and then a bunch clustered together, um, that's where things become a little bit more challenging. Um, so it's, I can't really give specific um, recommendations. I think when when your borings are spaced irregularly, you just have to look at the totality of your data set and think about whether you have um, you know really enough data to make a good visual model or not. Sometimes you have to get additional data. Um, you can certainly you know let your search radius go to the entire um, data set. Um, so I, I don't think there's any way to give you real specific. Um, recommendations but um, I think when I have irregularly spaced data you know I'll typically make sure that my search radius um, is something similar to the maximum distance between any borings on my site so hopefully that helps um, it's grid, gridding and, and gridding data like this is a challenge because there's an infinite number of ways you can do it and really it's um, there's a little bit of trial and error um, involved in getting the look that you really expect at your site um, with regularly spaced borings a lot of that kind of disappears and you just have to uh, focus more on anisotropy so hopefully that helps yep thank you steve that uh the, the search radius is key there on the gritter uh it looks like i have time for one more uh question here from marcus he wants to take a look at the g boring data uh in excel what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open the worksheet here so you can see what the format looks like uh, and directly in uh, Voxler's worksheet. Again, you can just select the data set and go down to the property manager and click this edit worksheet. And this is going to take just a second to open up. Okay, and I, you know, I can't really comment too much uh, other than I can see the columns here. Um, you know, we had Easting, you know, the boring name, our well ID, whatever you want to call it. And then, um, uh, the easting, northing, the ground surface was constant here for each uh, boring location, uh, but does vary uh, per, and I'm, I'm scrolling down real quickly here, uh, but does vary per uh, boring location to match the ground, true ground surface. Uh, but probably 
uh, more important is um, the data point elevation. And this is where, uh, and as, as I scroll down here, this is where all the data, each uh, data observation was taken. Uh, we did see that in the scatter plot. And then um, if we remember the equation that Steve was uh, talking about earlier, he used all of these parameters um, and added these into that equation um, to come up with this um, uh, I sub T. I don't know if that's what you called it, Steve, but this I is sub the, the soil behavior type. Yeah, the soil behavior type. Uh, this is going to be a, uh, a number here that that uh, equation resulted in. And then we actually have a soil behavior type that Steve has added in here um, to show what is uh, the soil behavior type at every single uh, XYZ location across that huge data set. So um, we really are up against time here. Um, uh, hopefully, Marcus, that's what you needed to see. Uh, it's a pretty simple data set, but, uh, um, uh, but it's huge, right? And so again, 75,000 points uh, roughly. Um, again, there's going to be a, a, a complete video recording of what we covered today, and we'll have that posted later today. And um, that's going to uh, that's going to do it for us today. Uh, I first wanted to thank uh, Steve and Sub Enviro, um, uh, Subsurface Enviro Environmental Solutions (SES) uh, for allowing us to use their data, and Steve for being a guest presenter today. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, that made a, a very great and exciting webinar. Uh, and I'd also like everybody to uh, have a nice afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us today.